I'm going to tell you the life and times of Emil Zeiler. Emil Zeiler was a brave young soldier and a native son of Brighton, Colorado, who fought the battles of World War II during their darkest days in the Pacific. It all starts in Russia in 1905 when his parents, Catherine and John Zeiler, migrate to the United States of America. Upon their arrival, they locate to McCook, Nebraska, and then in 1915, they locate to Brighton, where they do various jobs on farms and so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, we're gonna go to the year 1920. The month is December 1920. The Zeidler family is working for the Emil Ayler farm, and at that time, on December the 8th, 1920, Catherine gives birth to Emil. Now, Emil is named in the honor of Mr. Emil Erler, in his honor, and he also considered to be Emil's uh, godfather. Now, during the 1920s, Emil works, you know, doing normal farm work, so on and so forth, and attending school. Now, in the, as the 1930s approach, we have the Great Depression. And Emil has to quit school at the eighth grade level to work hand in hand with his family for the support. Now we're gonna go down to October of 1939. Emil is now 18 years old. He joins the U.S. Army, okay? Upon joining the U.S. Army in 1939, Emil was sent to Pearl Harbor to Schofield Barracks at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. He does his training there, and upon uh, finishing his training, he is assigned to the Schofield Barracks. Now, we're gonna go to December the 7th. <laughs> Everybody knows that day. We're gonna go to December the 7th, 1941. Emil is on duty at Schofield Barracks when the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. Emil fights, and he survives. Aylin is wounded in 1943. He is sent back to the U.S. where he recuperates and is discharged from the Army in 1945. Now some of Emil's rewards are the Guadalcanal and the Sullivan Island campaign medals, three bronze battle stars, the Purple Heart, and the Good Conduct Medal. Also Emil is a member of the Pearl Harbor Survival Association. Also in 1945, Emil marries Mrs. Ellen Elaine Zepper Smith. And to that marriage, four children are born. It was always a lifetime dream to see his children graduate from high school. Like I say, Emil had to drop out at the eighth grade, but he always kept it in his mind, and it was his dream that his children were going to graduate from school, and they did. And also, Emil graduated from high school also. So that was a big uh, point in uh, Emil's life. Now, at the age of 57, tragedy hits Emil. But you got to remember, he's a tough old bird. He takes the bull by the horn and conquers the loss of his eyesight. Emil goes completely blind at the age of 57. But it, but it doesn't stop this man. You, you gotta understand, this man's a fighter. He fought through the, the most bla bloody battles of World War II. Um, I'm part of the, the Eppinger family from the Thornton area. And my mother was born and raised in Wattenburg, Colorado. I'm the fifth generation on her side. And my father was born in Globeville, Colorado. And they far and his parents farmed, which is now part of the uh, American Furniture Warehouse. And on I-25, he farmed the west side. My grandmother was the oldest of nine, excuse me, of 11, of nine sisters. They all lived here in Colorado. Most of the siblings are still here and we see them once in a while since most of them are gone, but they used to get together in groups and have these big family events and everything throughout the years. Um, 
also my mother's side of the family. Uh, she grew up, like I said, in Wattenburg. She went to school and graduated at Fort Lupton High School uh, in 1939 is when she graduated from there. Uh, then from there, she decided she was going to go to CSU. And of course, it was the Aggies back then. Um, and I actually still have her yearbook. She wanted to be an extension agent. She wanted to work in, in Colorado Extension of Services. Um, but between working a full time and going to school full time, she ended up having a nervous breakdown, came back to her home in Wattenberg and talked to her sisters and her sister talked to her about going in and assisting at one of the hospitals in Denver. She found out she really kind of liked doing that and she met my dad at uh, various dances, the Grange dances, East Lake and Elitch dances and that's where they kind of met off and on. She had no interest in him whatsoever <laughs> and continued doing her nursing. My dad ended up going to the war, uh, World War II and they were communicating back and forth by letters and decided that he wanted to marry her and asked her to come out by train to Michigan during the war and that's where he was stationed at the time and that's where they got married. Later they moved back and moved on to my grandparents' farm and their first home was a garage. That's where they lived for a couple years and he helped my grandfather until he built up enough money and built a farm on high, built, and bought a farm on Highway 7, just a couple miles west, which is now Todd Creek, Lowland Acres, and Highland Acres. My mom was known as Grandma Jessie because she, was, she worked at Dr. Klein's office, which was the first hospital in Brighton on um, First Street. Then from there, she worked for Dr. Waddell. Then she went up to uh, Beverly Manor Nursing Home, which is the place across from uh, Pizza Hut and the Brighton Community Hospital. They talked her into going over there and working there, and she worked 7-Eleven uh, for many years, uh, the night shift, and so she was on med surge. From there, Dr. Cardos and several of the other doctors talked her into going into the nursery and saying, you do so well with these babies, you need to be here. This is where we want you at. So she could continue to nurse 7-Eleven shifts, and was in the nursery. She loved it so much and she attended to so many of those babies. My name is Jenny Luke Carson. I was Tiny's second wife and um, he was known as America's biggest band leader. Now the big comes in a couple different ways. The first way it comes in is that he was big uh, as far as very popular, always in Billboard magazine as having um, the most popular records in the jukebox on that list, um, drawing in the most crowds as an orchestra, a very favorite orchestra, um, mainly in the Midwest, but then all the way coast to coast he would travel. Um, he was a big man. He was six foot one and 365 pounds. Now, he, every article about him always mentioned that and he used it to his advantage in his promotion. His mother, who's buried over here, um, said that really never bothered him. In fact, when he first started out and uh, having his own band, uh, it was called Harry's Hilltoppers. And uh, it was known as a fat man's band uh, because everyone was at least 225 pounds. And that's where he was affectionately first called Tiny. And for his whole life, in fact, his grave says Tiny on it. He uh, became very popular on the Lucky Strike radio show. He used to gross a lot of money in those days, 22700 for like an engagement. That was the same thing that the Glenn Miller Band would bring in and Laurel and Hardy. So you know, a lot of people say they don't really remember him or know his name, but he was extremely popular and you know successful he's definitely a ladies man um you know he had a charismatic personality um tall dark and handsome demeanor and after all he was married three times and that's where i come in <laughs> we married in 1946 we bought a home in fort wayne indiana and we lived there for a while we only married two years um 
I actually came from a little group called the Three Little Maids. Um, I have a really religious um, background. Um, my dad would take us into Decatur on the street corners of Skid Row, and we were in the Salvation Army. And my three sisters and I would sing, and we'd have our tambourines and all. And my dad was really optimistic about our success, and so he said, I'm going to get you a job on WLS. And he really thought it was going to happen right away, the first audition. And it did, the first audition. And so we're pretty well known, too, in, in that particular group. It was after that that I reinvented myself as Jenny Lou Carson. I used to make my cowgirl outfits, and I actually did rope tricks, and um, just um, I even did bullwhip type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then it took off, and like I said, I became writing number one, first number one hit by a woman was Jenny Lou Carson. And um, my song portfolio is like over 170 songs. Um, so if you have a chance to come, I put both um, my songs in tiny songs. You might recognize some of them. Now, I actually wrote for people. Um, like I, my first hit came from Tex Ritter, um, a lot of famous people that um, I did, you know, songs for. And, um, but then I got some of my own. When I would sing them, I also had hits, too. So uh, you might know some of them. The first one is You Two Time Me One Time Too Often. That was my first number one that I sang. That's great. Before that, you know, country music always has a story in itself, right? So Don't Rob Another Man's Castle. That one I wrote for um, Tex Ritter. It was performed by everybody. It was performed by Eddie Arnold, the Andrews, Andrews Sisters, Ernest Tubb. And it became number one several different times when people would sing it. So I was pretty. Another one that inspired me by uh, Hank Williams Jr. was called, um, let's see, Let Me Go Devil. And I wrote that based on the struggle that he had with alcoholism. And then um, they were, you know, when television first came around and everything, they wanted to try to see if promoting a song through TV would help record sales like it did <laughs> and we called the same song let me go lover change the words a little bit oh and um it was recorded by like dean martin patty page and it was even on an i love lucy episode mm -hmm. so you remember it yes. oh good oh so gosh. very cool <laughs> and so, you wrote that yes my goodness 170 of them so tiny's big break uh came with angry so i'm gonna play you angry So, you know, what does that have to do with Brighton? You probably you know, right? Because <laughs> he was born in Illinois. But uh, he went into semi-retirement, and he bought a dairy farm up in Fort Lupton, right on um, the main road, Fulton Ave. And um, he also uh, had a radio station on 4th Ave, uh, just off from Bridge, called Cahill. And I just figured out Cahill. I don't know if that was a coincidence or not. Um, but he did that, and he sometimes would go into Denver and um, be a DJ down there. Brighton was established as a city in 1887, and the Lovelaces came here in 1889. The Lovelaces are actually from Missouri. Both W.G. and Annie were born in Missouri and they came here in 1889. In Missouri, the family was quite prominent. The Ms. W.G.'s father and grandfather were both very involved in politics. So my theory is that they came out here to kind of, you know, live their own lives and not live under the shadow of the elder Lovelaces. So they came here in 1889. W.G. was a lawyer. He had an 
office both here in Brighton and in Denver. So they were very well off and I'll explain how for sure I know that in a few minutes. His, I guess his wife was Annie. They were very involved in business here. The main thing they were, they were known for is starting the bank. That's what this is about. So they started the Bank of Brighton. Now, if you live in Brighton, that building might actually look familiar. It's on the corner of Bridge and Main on the north west corner. The family was also involved in several different things here in Brighton. Annie was actually on the school board. They had six children, so she was very involved in the school board. Their daughter, Alice, who's also buried here, she was the, from the first graduating class of Brighton High School. Brighton High School, 1905. There were two of them. <laughs> two graduates in 1905. So that's what they also helped start the Presbyterian Church. Have you seen the little church on 4th Street that says Historic Church? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the first Presbyterian Church. Uh, WG was also a partner at one time with Mr. Carmichael, who's a big name here in Brighton, and Mr. Strong. So they were very involved in very many things as far as I can tell. Now, the history pretty much stops though in 1906. Annie, Mrs. Lovelace, became ill and died. I could not find what she probably died of and what she actually died of. In 1906, you probably either died of TB, diphtheria, anything, any contagious disease. 1906, you could have died from influenza. 1906 was starting to be the beginning of, the, of what we would later call a pandemic in 1918 of influenza. So there's many things she could have died of. But pretty much after that, there's nothing in the, in the history book. Now, most of my information has come from this book, which is the History of Brighton. This was put together and compiled by Alvin Wagner and Pat Reiter, and it's the history of writing for the first hundred years. It's a compilation of different people writing different articles about things and articles they got like from the original newspaper. Uh, WG was also involved in the first newspaper here in Brighton, which was the Brighton Register. So like I said, he was involved in a lot of things until 1906 when he's, he just doesn't show up in the history books. Now, the next time that he appears in the book is in 1923. They actually have a, a list of the people that were here in 1923, uh, the census. And it says Lovelace, W.G., Alice, the lady, who, their oldest daughter, and then it says the name Elizabeth. That's it. So I have no idea who this Elizabeth was. They had six children, but there was no child named Elizabeth. <laughs> As I said, this is Martin Bromley. Uh, he was my great-grandfather. Him and his brother Emmett uh, came to Colorado in approximately 1880. Uh, Emmett homesteaded up here on Bromley Lane. Martin homesteaded down in Commerce City where Highway 224 and I-76 cross. There's a big lake there and a batch plant. That was his home. He originally built a uh, sod house. He did marry uh, Grace Claude Felter. Uh, later on they built a bigger two-story house. They had uh, nine kids, three uh, sons and a daughter, then uh, four sons, uh, the fifth uh, child being my great-grandfather, my grandfather, uh, and then the youngest uh, quite a bit later was another daughter, so he ended up with two daughters. Uh, they were he had approximately 300 acres down there. Uh, he also had quite a bit of property up here on um, on this side of Sable in south of Bromley Lane. He had quite a bit of property there. He had some property over on um, 144th. Uh, down in Commerce City he had a big dairy um, and he was a farmer and as far as I know that's all he ever did. Anyway he um, uh, lived down there and they had the big dairy and the kids were all, all the boys especially had to uh, help in the dairy. In 1901 and 1902 the legislature was developing a smaller county away from Arapaho and Emmett over here entered the bill, the third bill in the Colorado legislature to create Adams County. So Adams County is formed. Uh, the family story is that uh, the governor, Aver Adams, uh, was governor, which the dates aren't quite right. But anyway, that's the family story. He went to Emmett and said, I want to thank you for naming the county in my honor. 
And he says, can I do you a favor? And Emmett says, yes, make my brother the sheriff. So now at the stroke of the pen, December 1st, 1902, Governor Orman signed the bill that appointed Martin the first sheriff of Adams County. He was the first sheriff of Adams County. He had no, there was nothing here. Uh, not too many stories are told about him being the uh, sheriff, uh, but we did um, hear a story from one of his grandsons who's still living, a uh, Clinton Bromley. Clint always told that um, Martin took him and some other grandchildren out by Bar Lake rabbit hunting. Uh, and when they come across some rattlesnakes, uh, Martin took out his service revolver and it misfired three times. Clinton said that he asked, he said, Grandpa, how do you shoot the bad guys? And uh, Martin says, oh, I don't shoot them, I just beat them with my gun. <laughs>